Hey everybody, Jeremy here again. This is part two of my conversation with Dr. Reluctant, Dr. Paul Henneberry. And again, I'm doing this interview solo because Ken is just so busy with the things of life. And it, it's it's good stuff, but he's he's very busy. So I hope you enjoyed part one. If you haven't heard part one, you might want to go check that out. We talked mostly in the first part about God's communication with us and how we can understand His plain speech toward us. He spoke to us in plain speech that we might understand and uh, explored a few different topics related to that, God's communication. We started to get into biblical covenants, and in this episode, we're really going to get into that. The covenants of the Bible, why those are important, and how that actually helps us develop a worldview. So, again, I wouldn't listen to this on two times speed. I would slow it down to under 1.5, probably. But that's just me. You know, do what you want. Try it out. Test your brain. See if you can do it. That'd be a fun little exercise for you. But before we get into part two, I want to let you know that this episode is brought to you by West Eden. Go to westeden.co, not westeden.com, westeden.co, and check out what they have over there for Christian apparel, all kinds of Christian clothing. I think there's some drinkware and all kinds of interesting stuff uh, that they have that is designed really well, and it has a biblical message. Usually you'll find stuff that's designed well, but the message stinks, or you'll find something with a good message, but the design is really dorky. Westeden.co fixes that by bringing you both. So go to westeden.co, and at checkout, use coupon code DOTHEOLOGY15. That's all lowercase, all one word, DOTHEOLOGY15 for 15% off your order. Shout out to West Eden for sponsoring today's episode. After the music, you'll be jumping right into part two of the interview. Uh, It's really not a super clean break, so you're really just jumping right in. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, Also, I should mention, sorry, sorry, I know you want to get into the content you came here for, but I should mention, you should review our podcast, rate it, or review it, or both. iTunes, wherever, iTunes, Apple Music, whatever it's called. That's probably the main place. If you could do that, that'd be really, really nice. That would be super duper nice. So if you could do that, please do. We would really appreciate it. All right, after the music, part two. Neither Bethel nor Hillsong meet the biblical definition of a true church. Did you know that Jesus was born again? Is his view heretical? If it isn't, then there's no such thing as heresy. It's not just a black and white issue. There's an issue, there's a question of moderation and how damaging and how harmful things are. Even the most moderate charismatics actually act as like a gateway drug that does lead people into the realm of bizarre mysticism. Angelic forces, angelic reinforcement. When the apostles use the word atonement, they do not depict an angry God. It's cryptic, it's watered down, it has nothing to do with the judicial aspect of the Christian gospel. The most important of all doctrines is that the Bible is the word of God. They have different ideas than you do. You don't have to automatically kick them out of the kingdom. As we can see that, let's think about the New Covenant and how the New Covenant in particular interacts with the other covenants. You said a few moments ago that the New Covenant is uh, what has replaced that Mosaic Covenant, that conditional covenant that God made with his people, Israel. Uh, Let's explore that for just a little bit. This New Covenant that we're in, how does that interact with the other covenants and how should that shape our understanding of the other covenants, if at all? Okay, well, of course, you, uh, you straight away lost half your audience because you've, you've claimed that we're in the new covenant. <laughs> and of course, a lot of dispensationalists have a lot of problems about that statement. They believe that the new covenant is only made with Israel because of Jeremiah 31. I'm not too sure any of any of those kinds of dispensationalists listen. Maybe they do. I'll, okay. I'll find out by the number of emails I get after that. All right. Fair enough. Well, that's on you. <laughs> so, um, but again, it, it comes from what we need to do is that we need to read the texts themselves. We need to understand what the new covenant is. The new covenant replaces, obviously, the old covenant, the law, 
the law, if we could keep it, would be a way of salvation. OK, if we could keep it, God would not be able to keep us out of heaven. As it is, it's pretty easy for us for him to keep us out of heaven. So, uh, again, God, in his grace, brings in a, a new way of, uh, of getting of being reconciled to God, a new way of ridding ourselves of sin, a new way of redemption and salvation. That is what the new covenant is about. All of the new covenant texts deal with that plain issue and everything flows from that issue. So the new covenant is the only covenant in the Bible that God makes that has anything to do with the salvation of the soul and with forgiveness and redemption. Uh, the Noahic covenant has to do with uh, Noah and his uh, his immediate family being rescued, but the, the actual oath of the covenant isn't even to do with redemption. It just means that he's not going to flood the earth again, you see? Mm -hmm. uh, the Abrahamic covenant speaks of the seed, capital S, uh, Genesis twenty two eighteen, 18, which is the most likely uh, text that uh, Paul is alluding to. And... Um, but that doesn't have anything to do with, uh, with salvation, at least in the oath that's taken by God in uh, you know, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, Genesis 2. So uh, where, where do we find the salvific content that we need? Because if, if we don't get salvation, God can make as many covenants as he wants, and he doesn't have to do a thing. He doesn't have to lift a finger because we just, we're sinners. We fail. It's only when sin is taken away that we have a chance of doing what is necessary for him, therefore, to, to uh, bring in the fulfillment of these covenants without us ruining the world again, you see? And, and one of the explicit promises of the new covenant is forgiveness of sins, which, I mean, just that, that promise alone basic, sets, it up, sets it apart from the other it's covenant. It's the basic promise. Yeah. It's, it's there in Jeremiah 31, of course, but it, that's where it's called a new covenant. Um, but when Paul uses the term the new covenant, or when Christ uses it, the term the new covenant, he's speaking about more than... Uh, Jeremiah 31, he's speaking about those texts and promises in the New Testament where God promises that he's going to bring salvation. And he's going to do it covenantally, which shouldn't surprise anybody. And then, uh, you know, Jeremiah introduces the fact that it is covenantal. And he, of course, is dealing particularly with uh, Israel in that context. Um, but Isaiah goes further than that. He doesn't talk about the new covenant, but what he does say is that he is going to save the remnant of Israel, and he's also going to reach out to the Gentiles. He's going to restore the earth, and he's going to do it through the servant. This is um, uh, particularly Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 49. And in Isaiah 49, can I read a little bit to you here? Oh, yes. okay. The word of God is better than the word of Paul or the word of Jeremy. So It is. Yes. Well, providing it's not reinterpreted by Paul. So <laughs> that right. it really is the word of Paul, you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Isaiah 49, 1. I'm just going to read this out and make a couple of comments as I go through. Listen, O coastland, to me. And take heed, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. From the matrix of my mother, he has made mention of my name. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me a polish, polished shard. In his quiver, he has hidden me. Obviously, that's metaphorical. But it has to do with the fact that uh, the servant here that's being spoken of is being uh, prepared for a, a certain specific use, just as an arrow. And uh, it's about to be used too. 
he has said to me, you are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. So is he now talking about Israel, the nation? Uh, that's possible because there are other servant songs where Israel is certainly in view. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob, well, that's Israel, back to him. So that Israel is gathered to him. So this can't be Israel that he's speaking to because Israel is the one that needs to be gathered back. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. So we're talking about salvation here, okay. Um, and thus, uh, sorry, thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nation abhors, to the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. Here's the verse, 49.8. Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth and to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. Okay, so, and then, of course, you've got uh, the next passage is, uh, that you may say to the prisoners, go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourselves, which, of course, is used in the Gospels and applied to Jesus. So the servant here is Jesus. Jesus is going to be made as a covenant. OK, well, Jesus. Is the Lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the world, so he's already an animal, as it were, that's going to be sacrificed. And. At the institution of uh, the Lord's Supper, he says, this is the blood of or my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you. Now, you can't have more identification with something than your own blood. And so uh, Christ, you see, not only is he the mediator of the new covenant, as in the book of Hebrews, but he is the new covenant, which is why Paul can say in Second. Corinthians 3, you know, we are uh, ministers or ambassadors of the new covenant. Why? Because they're preaching Christ. Mm. They're preaching his salvation as, uh, as the Lamb of God or as the covenant animal of, uh, of Hebrews 9. So uh, the new covenant, therefore, is personified in Jesus Christ. Now, look what this does. I'm now going to answer your question. So you have all of that. <laughs> what was the question anyway? Well, never mind. Um, <laughs> so um, what it does is that because Jesus, as the new covenant, you know, he brings salvation. Salvation is not just something that's abstract. It's, it's, it's in him. So he's the new covenant that brings salvation. Once somebody enters into him, into the new covenant with him, then all of the other covenants must be fulfilled literally. Mm. You see, God is obliged to fulfill his oath. Mm. Now, the other thing from this, which I think is more interesting, and, and I think uh, this, is, this is what I was really um, excited about, is that this makes the whole of the Bible story Christocentric, but not in an artificial way mm -hmm. where you read him in anywhere because of your typology or because of, you know, um, you, your system has already decided it's going to this, be that way. No, no he allegorical emerges. sense whatsoever. Yeah, he emerges. He emerges out of this covenant program because everything, all of these 
great structural covenant, covenant these teleological covenant, covenants, which are also eschatological, of course, because they're prophetic. Hmm. They all run through him, so they converge into the new covenant, which is why new covenant passages also include aspects of you know, Noahic, Abrahamic, Davidic covenants within them. And they emerge, and here's the thing, not spiritually. They emerge from him literally hmm. to be fulfilled in his kingdom. So what this does is it makes the Bible and the whole plan of God truly uh, Christological. And, of course, why shouldn't it be? Because everything is made through him and for him. Uh, he's the one who humbled himself and came into the world as a human being. He's the one who bore our sorrows. He's the one that died in his own world. So, you know, why shouldn't he be the focus of what God is doing in this world, which is his? Amen. Well, so then is it proper to say that as members of God's church, God's household, we are in the new covenant right now? Is that proper yes. to say? Yes. Amen. Yes, we have to be. And Israel will be in the new covenant when they look on him whom they pierced. Do you see? Yes. Uh, and then the nations will be in the new covenant in, um, in the kingdom. Because they're going to be not just Israel, but nations too. Now, I'm a progressive dispensationalist, lining right. more with Bach, Blazing, Saucy, and the gang. Sure. Uh, that's pretty similar to progressive dispensationalism. Why don't you just call yourself a progressive dispensationalist? Because, because I don't have the same view of uh, complementary hermeneutics that uh. Blazing and Bach does. I don't see, I don't have the same understanding of the church as a mystery as Saucy does. Mm. I, I don't um, have the same. The, in in Blazing and Bock's chapters on the covenants in their book on progressive dispensationalism, um, what they do is that, to me, they, they make the covenants a bit of a, a wax nose in order to put David on the throne or Christ on David's throne now. So... You know, I don't see that. I understand their arguments, and I also applaud what they've tried to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, Saucy and Blazing and Bach, I mean, I quote them in my book. Um, they've done some very good work, and it's helped me to, to understand uh, ways, where's to, uh, sorry, ways to go, questions to ask, and if you don't mind me saying so, ways not to go to. Sure. Yeah, um, so, yeah, that's that's why, because I think that the essence of what I'm saying is different. I am saying that uh, dispensations are not really important. I think yes. that they're tertiary. I don't even think they're secondary. I think they're tertiary. Um, I think the covenants of, of where it's at, they drive the certainly the post-flood mm. world up to the new heavens and new earth. And uh, this idea of Christ as a new covenant and everything coming through him and from him is not what I find in progressive dispensationalism, even though they, they have commended, commendably, they've solved the new covenant issue by just actually believe in what Paul says, <laughs> which is just, uh, it just boggles the mind where you, you, uh, and I don't mean any offense to anybody who disagrees with me here, but, you know, you can't say you use a plain sense hermeneutic and you interpret Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 in a plain sense or literal view. Mm -hmm. And then you fail to interpret First Corinthians eleven twenty five in the mm -hmm. same way. Yeah. Um, you know that's that's uh, obviously there's a progress in Revelation. You know why yes. not just call it that mm -hmm. rather than saying oh no Paul means something which he doesn't clearly mean mm -hmm. in order to stick to what Jeremiah said. The two things are not against each other. Yes, we can see of course an expansion of 
uh, obviously revelation and expansion of significance of uh, what has been said before, and um, that we are not contradictory for doing so. Uh, it seems like a very basic principle yeah. to me. I, Another very good book, by the way, Jeremy, I don't know if you've, you've probably read it, is uh, All Things New by Carl B. Hawk. Mm, you know that no, book? I, I don't know that one. You should get it because he's a progressive dispensationalist and he has a, I don't agree with everything he says, but he has a wonderful chapter on Israel in the New Testament, which is, is worth buying the book for. Hawk like the bird? No, hawk like uh, the drink. So H O C H. Ah, okay. Very good. Yeah. Um, now, in all of your discussion here of uh, biblical covenants and the Christocentricity that really allows these covenants to be fulfilled in a literal sense. I heard no talk of the covenant of works or the covenant of grace, or for that matter, the uh, covenant of redemption that you've been writing about so much as you've been yeah. deciphering covenant theology. Uh, How remiss of me. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> can, can you just give a, a brief, I, I know it's very difficult, but a, just a simple brief overview of how your view of these biblical covenants contrasts with the reformed covenant theologians perspective to this uh sure well so, yeah that's of course a good question again they got there first hmm. okay so they've nabbed they've nabbed the prize uh you know name <laughs> um and it would be great to pay them money to, to have the name but i think we're past that so um yeah, I mean, with the, basically, again, there are assumptions in covenant theology. And I'm writing this, this series on deciphering covenant theology, not for covenant theologians, really. They've got enough uh, explanations of it, and they've done some good work on that to explain it to their own school. But I'm writing it for really dispensationalists or other people that don't understand covenant theology and may be tempted to misrepresent it. And I'm only, I'm at, I'm at uh, post number 10. I've got a lot more to do. And one of the things I want to do is to actually talk about the genius of covenant theology. Uh, you know, once I've kind of described it and to, I think, uh, well, it certainly extent. makes things clean cut and simple. Oh, sure. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So basically what covenant theology does is it starts at the cross. So, um, you know, so the Bible is a big book and, you know, starting here hmm. means you've got all of this that you're skipping over and you're going to have to go back to. Hmm. Um, but they start there at the cross and um, with this idea of redemption and the, the whole idea of the Bible is the history of redemption which, of course, isn't a major part of the Bible, but it's not the main thing. I mean, it's the main thing is what we're in, is creation. And um, so they, they want a, a focus or a lens through which to understand the Bible through the cross. And that lens is a federal lens, the lens of a pact. Uh, first of all, a pact uh, in between the persons of the Godhead, the covenant of redemption, although not all covenant theologians agree with that. Um, and you get that, you know, with, uh, you know, the, the, the body you have prepared me and the, the, such language as that, which speaks about, uh, you know, the Lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world, all of that pre-creation language about, the purpose of Christ coming into the world. There was an uh, inter-Trinitarian covenant made in eternity past. Most covenant theologians would agree with you, although many of them would say it's only intra between the Father, Father and the Son. And Son. Now, well, in any case, uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah. the, uh, as you were just saying, though, the the idea is that there are there's there are these packs. P A C T S PAX yes. that, that define redemptive history. And that's kind of their pre-understanding starting point. And that's, yes. that's and why they the launch is, into that. Yes. And they, and they've, you see, they've, because Christ talks about the new covenant and of course they've got the old covenant. It's, it's a, a great device that they've come up with to speak about the, 
Bible story covenantally. It kind of makes sense. Um, there's a lot to this, and I can't go into it, and, and you don't want me to go into it. But, <laughs> um, but basically, so they start at the cross there, and they see this agreement of God to send a Savior into the world who is uh, God the Son as a covenant, you see. Never, nowhere in the Bible are you told that it's a covenant. We all agree that God agreed, to, uh, uh, that the persons of the Godhead must have, quote unquote, agreed, to use that anthropomorphic term, to send Jesus into the world to die for the sins of man. Um, but there's no covenant. Why would why on earth would God need to make a covenant with himself? I mean, mm -hmm. he's not like us. He's actually reliable on all three persons of the Trinity are equally voracious in their very nature. And, and so, yeah. out the fact that the word covenant just doesn't appear in well, any of that eternity right. past uh, the eternity past narratives or ex explanations yeah. that we have. The fact that the word covenant doesn't appear is significant. It's kind of. And then, um, so then what you have is that you have uh, Adam in the garden, and they say, well, there's a covenant there between God and Adam. And you say, well, where's the covenant? I don't see any oath taken there. Nobody's taking an oath, like in the Abrahamic covenant, you know, Genesis 15 or the Davidic covenant and, and stuff like that. So they say that it's the prohibition that God gives to Adam in Genesis 2. Um, but it, again, they're inferring a covenant there where the Bible says there, or doesn't say that there is a covenant. And then, because Adam breaks that covenant, which evidently was to, uh, depending on who you read, that covenant was for him to just be faithful to God, not eat of that tree, and according to Greg Beale and people like that and their cosmic temple stuff, yes. it is now also to keep the devil out of the mm -hmm. Garden of Eden. Um, and he, because he failed at doing that, then um, in his grace, after the fall, the covenant of redemption now comes in. And, of course, it was hovering all the time over man waiting for him to fall. And it comes into time as the covenant of grace. So that covenant of redemption is, is the, is the inter-Trinitarian or the father and son's covenant uh, that, mm -hmm. that they've had in eternity past. And yes. when it comes into time and it's made manifest yes. on the earth, it's known as the covenant of grace. When it's actualized, it becomes yes. the covenant of grace. Right. Yeah, right. So, And the covenant of, of grace, again, there's no covenant in Genesis 3. Uh, there is God... Uh, pronouncing dooms on people and in genesis 3 15 he's pronouncing a doom on the serpent serpent um and that doom is of course about the skull crushing seed of the woman who's to come there isn't any language of redemption certainly there is uh you might infer that but you've got to understand that that's what you're doing you're inferring mm -hmm. and the problem here is how many inferences are we going to allow? You know, because we're already inferring a covenant where it doesn't say there's a covenant. Now we're inferring salvation uh, as well as that. And we're putting the two together and saying it's this covenant of grace, which is the covenant of redemption, which we've also inferred. Mm -hmm. And we're building the whole, we're going to interpret the whole Bible on these inferences, which are not in the, in the word of God. Um, so that's why I didn't mention these three covenants when i was talking about biblical covenantalism because they're not there and by the way jeremy there is no no uh, scholarly dictionary uh with a uh, that i know of like um you know the big uh ibp dictionaries of uh, the pentateuch and the prophets and so on but it, we're kind of restricted to the pentateuch their articles on covenant never mentioned these theological covenants because, of course, they are not exegetically uh, defensible. They're just not there. And neither does uh, Christopher Wright in his uh, uh, books on, uh, on uh, the mission of God. 
and uh, Daniel Block in his recent book on covenant and uh, sealed with an oath. Uh, this book here by Paul Williamson, mm. who also writes uh, the one on covenant for the, the big dictionary, the IVP dictionary of the Pentateuch. They openly say there is no covenant before um, Genesis chapter 9, even though Genesis 6 speaks about it. There is no covenant before that. And I do know, I do know, I'm going to jump in. Sorry, I know you wanted to say something, but I'm rabbiting here, so I'm going to keep rabbiting. <laughs> I do know that that uh, well, Gentry and Wellen and William Dumbrell, I know that they they interpret the Hakim Berry in uh, Genesis 6 as referring to a covenant that was previously made. Mm. But, you know, well, um, you just spoke a little Hebrew. Can you translate that for the sake of uh, the audience? Yeah, it, it means to um, it, it means to actually actualize a covenant. It's not to not karat, which is to cut a covenant. the The term that's used there is to actually bring the covenant or or, or initiate what was previously agreed upon. This yeah? language is in Genesis six. Yes. So, um, but of course, there are many, many scholars, Daniel Block and uh, Paul Williamson are among them, and many of them who, who say, well, no, you can't, it's, it's just, you, you cannot be that detailed about it. You know, there is this flexibility to language. You can't say that a technical sense is being used by God in Genesis 6, especially because the logical connection between Genesis 6 and Genesis 9 make it the same covenant. Mm. Um, the, the, what he's going to do, he's going to make a covenant, he says in Genesis 6, but he also says he's going to bring a flood upon the earth. And then in Genesis 9, verse 11, he says he's not going to do that again. Mm. So uh, without trying to find a uh, create uh, a covenant before that the plain reading of scripture is that there isn't a covenant uh before god makes it with noah and with creation in genesis 9 um i was going to say something else oh yeah well even if you do even if you do agree with gentry and wellham on that and i would like to where's the oath yeah yeah Where's the oath? There isn't an oath, so you don't know what the covenant's about. So that means, again, coming back to your quotation of Barcelos, you can introduce something else, you see, and fill it with a meaning that you want, and then you can call it biblical. Well, I have uh, Block's book on covenant right back there on the video, the shiny black one. <laughs> and I actually just cracked it open for the first time yesterday. Oh. Um, I really enjoy Daniel Block. His book, For the Glory of God, A Biblical yeah. Understanding of Worship, is one of the best books I've ever read outside of the Bible. I recommend it and buy it for lots of people. Well, um, I wouldn't recommend, sorry, I, I, I've actually reviewed this book on my blog. The one on covenant or the one on yes, worship? Yes, I, okay. I did a full well, well, that's what I was going to ask is, is tell me about this book because I, <laughs> I, I, I've not known his view on, on covenant, which is why I bought it, uh, but I just cracked it open. So I, I don't it, know. Well, I don't know if I want to spoil it for you. It's idiosyncratic. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> it's idiosyncratic. Ah. Uh, you see, Block is known for being an independent thinker and he's done you know, a lot of his really good work is because he's not afraid to go off and explore and disagree with people and say, no, let's look at this again. So he's at his best when he does that, particularly in Deuteronomy. He's really good. And he's got some yes. good critiques of the cosmic temple stuff too, which unfortunately are not in that covenant book. But uh, what he does in that book is he, first of all, he, he doesn't define covenant very clearly in the book, which is very unfortunate on a huge <laughs> book about covenants. Yeah, titled yeah. Covenant. Yeah. Title. And then, um, then what he does is that he, yes, he's very clear on the fact that there are no covenants before the Noahic covenant. He, um, but then what he does is that he tries to, to build um, connections between the covenants 
which I think the Bible doesn't do. So that he talks about um, the covenant with Noah is actually he calls the Adamic covenant, or at least part of it. Mm. You're probably familiar with the fact that a lot of particularly reformed writers like to break down the Noahic covenant into two as some of them like to break down the Abrahamic covenant into mm-hmm. two covenants too. Making the um, conditional through the, through that. Breakdown. Well, one of, yeah, one of them is, well, yeah, I won't get into that because we have to go swan and off into another area, yeah. but, but um, so he, he says that there's an Adamic aspect to the covenant that was made with Noah. And by Adamic, he just means man. He doesn't mean Adam. Although when you get to the New Testament, he does mean Adam, hmm. which is rather confusing because, of course, of the Genesis, sort of the Romans 5 hmm. uh, issue, you know, 5, 12 through 21. So because of that, that uh, the two headship view, Adam becomes very prominent again, and he introduces the Adamic aspect to actually name Adam as a... Um, a uh, a, a party to it hmm. but he doesn't do that in the old testament which is very confusing and then he with the noahic covenant that's the creation covenant do you see because he says that it's not really with noah per se well here's the, my problem with that is that you're ignoring genesis one and uh, you're lo- ignoring the leader and the dominion given to man that he is the, the one who is the vice regent and the spokesperson for the whole of the creation. So it, and, and it, it does beg the question, do you think really that Noah understood that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that is just a lot to read into. I don't that. know. I don't oh, know. My. Oh my. I don't know. But anyway, so when it, wow. and then it goes on to the Israelite covenant and the Israelite covenant, he sees in, four different parts you see so that the mosaic covenant uh is is uh the first part near sinai is the first part then you have the deuteronomic deuteronomic uh re what's the word republication Mm. of it in book of deuteronomy that's israelite covenant part two then you have the, um, I want to get all of this. He, he has another aspect to it, which I forget now, just now. And then the new covenant also is part of the Israelite covenant, you see. And then he has the Davidic covenant too. And then he follows this rather cumbers- cumbersome uh, system and he puts it into the New Testament. And to me, it, it's really problematical. Also, I think something that I have a real problem with is that he thinks that God's Mosaic code is doable. He thinks it's actually doable. Now, of course, many of the things are doable. The problem is they're not doable all the time. Mm-hmm. Just as, just as um, I mean, one, one can talk. Like a, a Wesleyan perfectionism read back into a Jewish context. Yeah, kind of. I mean, oh. I mean, I, that's not. He's he's more from a, a uh, sure. A yeah, Mennonite. He's not Anabaptist. a Baptist. Yeah, he's a Canadian yeah, yeah. Mennonite. Yeah. So, uh, but at the same time, you know, you've still got this problem that of uh, yeah, okay. In theory, in theory, these things can be done, but nobody's done it apart from one guy. So. Um, to me, it's like you need to scrap that and and, and talk about something that actually is feasible. Wow! Wow! So, uh, so your your solution then to this issue of covenant theology, dispensationalism, the covenants is let's define our terms by Scripture alone, by what God has said, by what God is doing. Let's let's only see covenants where God has revealed covenants. And obviously a major portion of that is featuring the word covenant where yeah. there's an oath and where there are, there are actions. And, and this actually becomes a, a viable biblical worldview. That's, that's well, your that's, understanding. Thank you for saying that because in my, the reason I did my dissertation on theological method is because I realized that dispensationalism 
and here I'm going to lose half your viewers. The other half, the, the half yeah. that stayed. Yeah, so it's just going to be us two from now on. <laughs> so um, is is because dispensationalism is not teleological and it's not prescriptive. It's not prescriptive. It's descriptive. And covenant theology, the genius of covenant theology is that it's prescriptive, which is why it can produce uh, a biblical counseling uh, arm to it, which, of course, is derived from Van Til's apologetic uh, work. And, of course, Van Til's been a big influence on me. Yes, I, I, you're also uh, called Dr. Precept somewhere. I saw that somewhere. Yes, that's my, that's my uh, email. So... Um, so yeah, I mean, with, um, lost my train of thought here, but, but, but so, yeah, with, with Van Til's work, what I, I saw is that he produces a whole way of looking at the world, which is revelational. He talks about revelational epistemology, revelation yes. theory of knowledge. Yes. And, um, he digs it out of scripture. Interestingly, he has to use a quote unquote plain sense hermeneutic in order to get to where he wants to get, even though he talks about covenant breakers and covenant fulfillers. But um, but he uses systematic theology and the doctrine of God and the doctrine of Christ also to put together a worldview. And that worldview is not only apologetically defensible, but it, it uh, becomes, as it were, the reality in which we live and move and have our being. Now, dispensationalism is incapable of doing that. And the reason it is, is because it defines itself by dispensations, which are descriptive, not prescriptive. The covenants are prescriptive. So because the covenants are prescriptive and they have a teleological aspect as well as an eschatological aspect and a strong Christological aspect to them, um, you can develop this into a, a, a worldview. Which is powerful. That's that's revolutionary. Uh, yeah. In that it it then becomes not just a a section of your theology; it becomes the overarching theme of of what you see and how you understand the Bible. That's right. That's right. So biblical, you know, the, re, the whole reason I dived into biblical theology actually was because of systematic theology, hmm. because I wanted to understand. Um, how do we arrive at a systematic theology which actually reports on what on the language that God uses in a faithful way without us um, introducing piles of our own uh, independent thinking mm -hmm. and calling it biblical? Very well. Well, I pushed the limits of your grace today. Thank you for hanging around for so long and covering so many subjects with me. Uh, I have a feeling this will be a two-parter. So thank You're you. You're very welcome. Anytime.